Today I'm really pleased to be here and talk to you about my book called A Cow Herd in Paradise, From China to Canada. Especially in light of the Premier's recent apology to the Chinese Canadian community for past wrongs, and we'll talk about those past wrongs. But first, let me tell you about why I wrote this book. The first reason is to honor my parents for their courage and for the sacrifices that they made in coming to Canada. When my father first came to Canada, he had to spend his first few months in a jail at the bottom of Burrard Street. The second reason I wanted to talk to you was to share our Chinese-Canadian history. It's a common history. It's what happened in Canada. It just happens to be what happened to the Chinese while they were in Canada. So in 2006, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, and just in May, our uh, Premier Christy Clark, made an apology, a formal apology, to the Chinese community for past wrongs. What Prime Minister Stephen Harper recognized was that the legislation that closed the doors to Chinese immigration and this head tax were discriminatory. Because even though I read in here that the Oriental problem was Chinese, Japanese, and East Indian, only the Chinese were targeted. These head, the head tax and the immigration laws did not impact any other group at all, only the Chinese. And he also recognized that those laws had long-term impacts. And so that brings me to the third reason why I wrote this book, and that is to put real faces in front of these facts of history. This is what happened in Canada, and this is what happened to one couple, one family. Because the effect, as Terry said, that that legislation had on a Dang, my father, and a Su, my mother, was that although they were married for over 50 years, they were forced to live apart for the first quarter of a century. Chapter 3, Father Reborn, a Dang, Canada, 1921. A Dang sailed to Canada on the once famous Empress of Japan. When it was launched in 1891 to deliver mail between Britain and Canada, the 148 meter ship was a model of efficiency, speed, and elegance. But by the time Adang sailed on the ship, it was far past its prime. He traveled with a distant cousin from his hamlet, a nephew of his benefactor. Advertisements had once extolled the fabulous amenities offered by the Empress of Japan. And for the 31 saloon or first class passengers on that particular trip, Adang learned that the ship was still a luxurious floating palace, providing different daily assortments of foods with foreign names like olu dufus, samun, cheesy, coffee, and wine. While boarding, Adang had stolen glimpses of the staterooms equipped with beds, chairs, and individual electric fans. But Adang and his cousin had accommodations in an open berth at one end of the main deck. These sparsely furnished cargo areas were designated solely for Chinese, Japanese, and other Asiatic men. At one time, the ship would carry up to 700 such passengers spread throughout the two lower decks. But Adang and his cousin shared the main deck compartment with only 110 others. In contrast to what he heard about the food for first class passengers, Adang and his traveling companions were offered the same meal of rice mixed with meager bits of so, day in, day out. It was not very tasty, and the helpings were small. However, they soon learned that the real food came in late in the evening, delivered by the kitchen staff. For about 20 cents a bowl, they could buy rice cooked in aromatic Chinese sausage or salted duck eggs. And between the two teens, they occasionally splurged and bought a couple of bowls of this Chinese comfort food, hoping to get information from the staff about the ship, and most importantly, about their destination. When the ship landed in Vancouver, the upper deck passengers alighted at their leisure, while the steerage passengers were counted one by one. At last, they too disembarked, but they were herded 
like prisoners directly to an immigration building at the bottom of Burrard Street, known to the Chinese as the pig pen. On board, they had been warned about having to wait in this no man's land until their papers were verified, the $500 head tax was paid, and a picture was taken for their identity document. The process could take months. No one knew the reason for these delays, but everyone who had been through it was convinced that it was the Chinese interpreters who were waiting to be paid some graft before processing any new immigrants. Taking in his surroundings, Adang couldn't help but notice that the walls were covered in Chinese characters. Some carved, some elegantly painted in ink, some written in crude, dark strokes, the color of dried blood. One quote in particular echoed his own thoughts. I have always yearned to reach the golden mountains, but instead it is hell full of hardship. I was detained in a prison. Who can foretell when I will be able to return home? March 1919. Adang spent his 19th birthday behind bars. October to February were four months of confinement and starvation in a cold, dank, dreary building in a chilly, damp, rain-drenched city by the sea. Who would have believed it a gold mountain?